Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, worship here at Rocky Mount Bible Church this morning. Uh, along the lines of encouragement to trust the Lord, Psalm 118 says this in verse 8, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. This world only offers a false sense of security. And it is only through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have confidence and uh, move forward with hope and grace because of him. So I'm going to invite you to sing this morning some of those truths. Would you stand together and we'll sing Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus just to take him at his word. Just a reminder, there's some kids stuff down by my office, uh, lost and found kind of stuff, so you might want to just go down there and take a peek um, and see, see if any of it's yours. Well, I thought we would do something um, fun for the books of the Bible, so we're going to play a little game. So what I want you to do, kiddos, is the first thing we're going to do is identify the book of the Bible. Okay, so you're going to look at the bi book or the picture and see if you can remember what the book is. And then we'll see if you can remember what the theme is, okay? So we'll pull the first picture up. And if you know what the book of the Bible is, I want you to raise your hand. So hold on one second, Lauren. <laughs> um, and so Mr. Jason and I are going to see if we can see who raises their hand first. And if you, if you raise your hand and I call on you and you get it right, then that means you've quizzed out. So hopefully that will give everybody a chance to do it, okay? So we'll just see how this goes. We'll just try it, okay? All right, you ready for the first one? Okay, well, this is the kids, for the kids, okay? Um, let's try that one more time. You ready? Go. <laughs> Daniel. Galatians. Okay, ready? Who knows the theme? All right, Ella. Unshackled. Very good. All right, the next one. Okay, Mariah. That's the theme. Very good. Okay, and who knows? Okay, Jackson. Ephesians. Good. All right, the next one. Okay, Chris. <laughs> That's the fun way to say it. Philippians, very good. All right, who knows the theme? All right. 
All right, you ready? Let's call it out. Three, two, one. Happily humble. Very good. Good try, buddy. All right, you ready for the next one? Andrew. Commander in chief is the theme. Okay, who knows what book is? Landry? Colossians. Okay. All right, you ready for the next one? Samuel? It's hard when you get called on, isn't it? All right, ready? Three, two, one. We'll all call it out. Three, two, one. First Thessalonians. Good. All right, ready? What's the theme? All right, we're raising our hands still. All right, Sarah, you ready? What is it? Good job. All right, let's do the next one. Um, Tommy? Good job. All right, who knows the theme? If you haven't answered one yet. All right, big kids, y'all can do it if you want. Pippi, you know this one? That's right. Second Thessalonians. What'd you say? Work while you wait. Very good. All right. I think we may have two more. All righty. Who knows what this book is? All right, Landry, what do you think? Which one? First Timothy. All right. Sarah, what's the theme? Very good. And last one? Uh, Paisley? That's right. Ty Moth. Very good. Second Timothy. And who knows the theme? What kind of manual is he reading? Spiritual combat. Okay, we're all going to have spiritual, uh, spiritual battles, and we can go to this one to figure out how to combat that. Okay, very good. Y'all did a great job with that. Very good. Well, we have a new unit, so we're learning a new memory verse. And it's Romans 12, 5. Who knows who wrote the epistle to the church in Romans? Who wrote that? That letter to the Roman church. Ella, do you remember? No. The Apostle Paul. Very good. This is one of his letters to the churches. All right, and he says, We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So that's what our unit is about, is about the church and how we are all members uh, with each other, okay? Building each other up and encouraging each other. All right, so let's try to read this together one time. You ready? Romans 12, 5. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. All right, so that means we also get a big picture question. And so our big picture question is, what is the church? Anybody want to raise their hand and guess what the church is? What is the church? Mariah, what do you think? <laughs> Anybody else have a thought what the church is? All right, well, let's see what the answer is. You ready? The church is all Christians everywhere who gather together in their communities to worship and serve God. Sometimes you'll hear this called the universal church. So that's every Christian, right? And then uh, we call this our local church, right? So it's a, a, all, all Christians everywhere who gather together in their communities to worship and serve God. So let's see if we can answer this together. I'll ask the question and then you read the answer. What is the church? The church is all Christians everywhere who gather together in their communities to worship and serve God. The early church was growing. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were telling people that Jesus had been raised from the dead. A large group of believers met together in Jerusalem. They shared everything they had. If someone had more than he needed, he gladly gave it away so everyone had what he needed. One man, Barnabas, sold a field and gave the money to the apostles. The apostles used the money to help people in need. Everyone who had land or houses did the same. Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold some land and pretended to give all of the money to the apostles, but they kept some of it for themselves. When Ananias brought the money to the apostles, Peter asked him, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? You could have been honest about what you did with the money, but instead you lied, not to us, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down 
died and was buried. Everyone who heard about this was filled with fear. About three hours later, Sapphira came to the apostles. She did not know what had happened to her husband. Peter asked her, is this all the money you got for the land? Yes, she said, that's all of it. Peter said, why did you and your husband agree to test the Lord? Then Sapphira fell dead too. Great fear came on everyone in the church and all who heard about these things. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to look generous, but they were greedy. The Holy Spirit changes our hearts to want to share with those in need because Jesus generously gave all he had so we can share in his riches and have forgiveness and eternal life. Sometimes the video says it best, so I might leave it at that, other than to say um, they lied instead of being honest, and um, we want to reflect the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. So let's give to, especially to our brothers in Christ, and then to everyone else who's around us, so we can reflect Christ. This member of the body is a little bit out of sync this morning. So thank you for your kindness to me. Uh, let's stand and we'll sing some more, okay? Thankful for the Lord's mercy, even when we're out of sync. What love could remember and all wrongs we have done.
Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, one of our last weeks in this remarkable book. We had friends in Texas this week endure what is almost assuredly a once in a lifetime type storm. And saw many messages about uh, the power going out and water going out and pipes bursting. And had a friend who spent an hour and a half in line at the grocery store in order to get some bread and some bottled water, just in unimaginable conditions. And someone asked them the question, if you were going back a week earlier with the knowledge of what would happen, how would you prepare differently? And uh, he said, well, of course, we would have stocked up on water. I think I would have tried to go down to Lowe's and get a little generator and maybe a little space heater. And there are things that I would have done knowing the calamity that was ahead in preparation in order to get ready for that day. If we were to ask The believers there in the first century who are being ministered to by our author, um, knowing the calamity that is ahead, knowing the trials that are coming, uh, knowing the kind of persecution that you're going to face, how would you prepare? And, And some of them say, well, what do you mean? What do I have to do to prepare? And fortunately, they have in front of them Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, it's not an advanced theology of perseverance. It's not a theological doctrine expose of election or an expansion of the means by which we're saved through the superior work of Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's much more pragmatic. The author is shifting here at the very end of the book to give them a handful of things that they will need to produce an enduring faith. How do we prepare now? How do we engineer our faith so that when the times get tough, we have an enduring faith? It's a shift, theologically grounded to be sure, but it's deeply, deeply practical. And what he calls them to here in the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 13, one of the great ways to prepare is this. Look, he says, there are a handful of crucial, vital, essential relationships that you must maintain if there is any hope of enduring in the faith. He starts in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 13 Let brotherly love continue. And that's where the impetus begins. I know that you know this word. This is one of the largest cities in the United States. It's named after this word. It's love for the brothers. It's Philadelphia. Right? It's used many, many times in the New Testament, but it's only used of one particular group. It's used of the kind of love that a brother or sister in Christ has for another member of the family of God. It is never once used of the way that Christians love people outside of the faith. It is never once used in the New Testament of the love that a family member even has for another family member. It's used exclusively of the love that is shared between members of the body of Christ. Let Brotherly love continue, Philadelphia. And this brotherly love is grounded in these five different relationships. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to explore what relationships are essential then in the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 13, vital to securing an enduring faith. Father, I pray this morning... In light of the love that we have received from you, we know that any kind of love that we're able to extend to anyone is possible only because we've been loved first, and we've been loved perfectly by you, not least of which, by the incarnation, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the intercession of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. If it is indeed true that an enduring faith values and protects key relationships, 
Let's take a look at Hebrews 13, the first six verses. Let me go ahead and read them all together, and then we'll make some observations here. First, let brotherly love that is Philadelphia continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unknowingly, that is, unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The first relationship we find here is the relationship to our neighbors or to strangers. He says in verse 2, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Hospitality, of course, is a big deal in the New Testament. Not only is every believer called to be hospitable to the people around them, but in fact it's a qualification if anyone wants to serve as an elder in the church. He must be found hospitable. Amongst all the other litany of qualifications that exist for our leadership, it's important that we recognize that right in the middle of that is that they exude hospitality. And then he says here what's interesting, it's not just that we should be hospitable because you never know who it is that you're ministering to. He says some people have even ministered to angels and they didn't even know that they were doing that. Genesis chapter 18, that's the first reference there. In Genesis chapter 19, Genesis 18, 1 through 8, and 19, 1 through 3, here are examples from Abraham and Sarah and Lot as they entertain strangers, not knowing, at least at the beginning of their ministry to them, that they were, in fact, angels. They were so open to the prospect of hospitality, of engendering a kindness and a love, a brotherly love with the people around them, that whoever came through their path, whoever... God sent to them, they were ready to be kind enough to them to minister to them. There are, uh, I think, two separate takeaways from this particular commission. It's a reminder for a community that needs this incessantly preached to them that not everyone is out to get them. Remember, it's a community in crisis. He's used the entirety of the book to remind them that persecution is just over the horizon. There are people who are out to get you. And it's interesting how... All of the authors in the New Testament have their own particular perspective and their own particular descriptions of the people who are out there who would seek to do them harm. And they are all led by the devil, right? The lion who is seeking, prowling around, seeking someone he may devour. He says here at the beginning, look, even though there is an extraordinary amount of pressure coming from outside the walls of the church, remember, you have a ministry to those people. Do not neglect to show hospitality to someone you don't know just on the possibility that they might be among those who could potentially hurt you. It's a reminder of the call, the bearing upon all believers to engage the unbelieving world. You might wonder if at some point our author hasn't run into Matthew and said, hey, Matthew, I remember In your book, they didn't have chapters and verses then, but at the very end, what we know is Matthew 28, 16 through 20, right? The great commission that you will be my disciples and you will make disciples going out, teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a work to do, a job, a calling to which we have been called. And when things get hard and when things get difficult and the persecution starts to rise, you're going to be tempted to circle the wagons tempted to become insular, to become fearful of the world around you and forget that that world is the field in which you've been called to work. Now, I know some of you grew up, and we spent a number of years there uh, when I was younger in a church that by conviction affirmed almost more enthusiastically than anything else, a doctrine of separation. Those people out there are unholy. Those people out there are wicked. And if you spend any amount of time out there with them, then you're going to be wicked as well. 
And so instead of ministering to those people, there is an innate fear of those people. And the most holy and Christ-like thing that we could possibly do was to avoid them at all costs. We won't go to their schools. We won't go to their malls. We won't go to their movies. We won't read their books. We won't listen to their music. We won't have anything to do with them because they might make us, that is in some sense ritually, unclean. They're like pig pen from the old Charlie Brown comics, wandering around with their big cloud of dust. They might make me dusty too. Now, anyone who has wrestled for 30 seconds with the Great Commission and has read anything about the life of Jesus Christ acknowledges that he spends an awful lot of time around dusty people. We looked at that last week, how he ate with sinners and tax collectors. And it's a bit closer to April 15th. I'm not sure which one is worse, right? But it's easy to allow that to happen inadvertently when times get hard. Not as a theological principle, but just as a matter of everyday life. Life gets hard. You're going through something. And it's unimaginably difficult, and you need help. And so you turn to the people that are closest to you, right? And, and before you know it, all of your phone calls are with people who are believers. And, and the only people that you have over, maybe you share a meal with, they're all believers. And you get a chance to go out and hang out with somebody, and they're all believers. And before you know it, you've done pragmatically what others have done intentionally as a matter of doctrine. You have insulated yourself from the outside world altogether and have violated this relationship and have neglected uh, as a, a matter unintentionally maybe, but neglected the responsibility to show hospitality to strangers. And who knows what blessings you may have forfeited by insulating yourself against the possibility of ministering to those neighbors outside of those whom you are intimately familiar with as members of the body of Christ. Do evangelicals have a reputation for circling the wagons? Of course we do. It is a constant struggle to remember that hospitality extends even to those strangers. The second relationship that he highlights here is in verse 3. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Of course, our author is speaking here very practically of the results of what's happening in the persecution there in the Greco-Roman Empire. Already in certain provinces and soon to be there at the end of the first century, it will be an empire-wide edict that it will be unlawful to worship Jesus Christ. They viewed the Christians in the early and middle parts of the first century as aberrations of Judaism. They didn't particularly care for the Jews. By the end of the first century, they were putting Christians to death all across the empire. And with the rise and fall of various emperors throughout Roman times, there were those who claimed to worship Christ, but there were many more who hated the Christians and murdered them by the thousands. Already they were being imprisoned for their faith. Already they were being physically persecuted. Already they were being pushed to the point where they had to choose Christ and death or the renunciation of their faith and the possibility of life. And he says, don't forget them. Don't forget them. And he says something absolutely fascinating here. While many of those present for the public reading of this letter were not yet pushed to the point of bloody persecution, many had, and some were imprisoned. Some had divested themselves of themselves and borne their crosses literally and figuratively and died for the name of Jesus. But look what he says here in verse 3. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Can't you see that this is a potential fate for you as well? Maybe today you're not in prison. Maybe tomorrow you will be. And then even more stringently here, he says, it's not just that you should remember them on the possibility that you might be like them, but he says, in fact, you are them, right? And those who are mistreated since you are in the body. We just talked about that in our children's ministry moment this morning. It's the most powerful metaphor used in the New Testament of how Christians relate to one another. We are in a body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about this. Some of us are hands, and some of us are feet, and some of us are eyes, but no one part of the body can say to another, I don't need you. You're not important. 
I'm a hand, really, really important. You're the left eyebrow. You have no bearing whatsoever. I have no need of you, right? No, we are all in this together. To the point where, when that body metaphor is emphasized in Romans 12 and in 1 Corinthians 12, the same commendation is used. When one part of the body rejoices, you rejoice. When one part of the body is devastated and weeps, you weep. We are in this as one coherent body. Um, A couple of months ago, uh, I chipped a tooth. And it didn't seem all that bad, right? A uh, little tiny chip, minuscule. And I went in, and uh, the guy said, look, I'm just going to put in a filling. And that tooth hated that uh, to the point where it was searing pain, a throbbing pain. And I went in, and they did a root canal. And here's what I can promise you, okay? Uh, first, I saw a dentist. I'm trying to be responsible. I wear my mask. I have my little Ohio State mask. And the dentist says, hey, you know where I went to school? Where? University of Michigan. (laughs) And I know this is bad. This is bad already, right? If you could not comically make a root canal any worse, of course, the guy had to be a Wolverine, right? Um, But then he does the procedure, and I feel relief. Here's what I can guarantee you. In the days that tooth hurt, (laughs) right, the rest of my body could not ignore that little tiny tooth. It was all I could think about, right? It consumed all the mental energy and all the process. But here's what happens in the body of Christ, and it's so easy to allow it to happen in the absence of Philadelphia, this brotherly love. Somebody in this room is going through something unimaginably difficult. And it's like we've just yanked that tooth out and set it to the side. It's not a part of us. We don't need to feel that. No, it's not just that you need to have empathy because this could happen to you. It is sympathy based on the fact that as a member of the body of Christ, it is happening to you. You're living through it. Their pain is your pain. Their glory is your glory. (laughs) Uh, I thought this week, uh, I don't know if any of you saw the story of a Canadian pastor who was jailed. That was largely a result of his unwillingness on theological grounds to comply with the Canadian government uh, as related to COVID restrictions. Uh, he told his congregation that they were not going to separate. They would uh, expand beyond the 15% capacity of their sanctuary and make of that what you will. We might have different convictions about how we relate to the government and its COVID restrictions. But I thought what was absolutely devastating was they told him, on the condition of your release, it would be this, that when we let you out, you are disallowed from preaching or pastoring. Now think about that for a moment. A federal government, in the case of public health, in the name of public health, told a Christian pastor that the only way they would let him out of jail is if he discontinued preaching. Took him away, (laughs) ran him in and out of the back door of the jail so he couldn't see his family, and is still holding him in prison. Now, now, that's a complicated and nuanced legal situation where he violated some laws, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not hard to imagine a day in the current political and ethical milieu in which we find ourselves that preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, affirming what the Bible has to say, ethically say about gender or about sexuality or about any number of issues will land you on a list of those who have been down with hate speech and that you might have to face actual legal consequences for saying exactly what the Bible says. Every generation has a certain number of alarmists, reactionaries. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want our church to be that church. But if you believe that the world is becoming intrinsically better until Jesus Christ returns you are embracing a naivete that is nowhere found in Scripture. It is going to get worse. Persecution will rise. Fidelity to Jesus Christ will wane in this nation unless by some miracle of God there is a revival the likes of which has not happened in the last several generations. And not if it comes, but when it does. Will we have the audacity to share the word of God clearly? And will we have the relationships to those both 
being persecuted and those in support of them to endure in our faith. We have to get ready now. The storm is coming. How are you preparing? Thirdly, he talks about relating to our spouses. Uh, Verse number four, let marriage be held in honor among all. Uh, No verbal forms here. The imperative is implied. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. He says, of course, let the uh, marriage bed be honored, right? The bed must be kept undefiled. That healthy sexual relationships in a marriage are not only a good thing, but if we read 1 Corinthians as clearly as we ought to, it is necessary in healthy marriages to have those kinds of intimate relationships. Outside of that, it's adultery, it's fornication. We've seen how devastating this can be when Christians ignore this particular commendation. You want to take down an international ministry, here are your two silver bullets. Mishandle money, defile your marriage bed. They will take them down instantaneously, right? You start siphoning a little bit of money off the top and stuffing it in your pocket, your ministry is done. You find out that there's an inappropriate relationship that you've been having with a member of the opposite sex. Your ministry is done. We saw this recently. I hate to even mention his name, but it should be mentioned. Ravi Zacharias, whose books I read, whose sermons I devoured, Every Sunday morning, I would get in the car, and on the way to church, I'd turn on the radio and listen to Ravi on the way here. What I learned about Christian apologetics from his ministry of the last 20 years, uh, for crying out loud, it was just really a couple of months ago, I shared an illustration. It was directly from Ravi Zacharias' ministry. But shortly after his death, there was an investigation done by all of those people closest to him and his family and his ministry partners and independent investigators and the people to whom he ministered. And everyone unanimously said, with very little work put into their investigation, that he had over decades a huge number of grossly inappropriate relationships and proved himself, if only half of those things are true, a serial rapist a sexual predator, an extraordinarily wicked man. You read the things that he said of the nature of God to these women that he abused, and it is vomitous. What did he do? He defiled his marriage bed. Now look, that man preached, I don't know how many sermons, how many messages over how many years, But the only one he'll be remembered for was the last one. This is important because some of you younger ones are here in this room. And I'm telling you this. um, And and look, you need to pay attention, right? You need to stop writing your notebook for just a second. You need to stop coloring. You need to look. Because you're going to get married. I'm going to tell you this. And I know we're diverging slightly here from what's going on in Hebrews 13. But this is essential to this particular commendation. You ready? Ready? You are going to guard that relationship with your life. You're going to guard that bed with your life. You understand? This is why the New Testament tells us not to marry unbelievers. This is why it's extraordinarily unwise for you to marry somebody who is spiritually immature. When it comes time, you're going to pick somebody. And you're going to have a whole list of reasons why you're picking that person to be your most important relationship outside of Jesus Christ in your life. Now, it's, it's, there's a whole host of things you need to be looking for, right? And, I, and I'm not telling you otherwise. You want to marry somebody who's attractive to you? That's a good thing. You want to marry somebody who's smart and can keep up with you? That's a good thing. Uh, you want to marry somebody who's funny and just puts you... Th- those are all wonderful things, right? But first and foremost, on your list must be this. Do they have an all-consuming passion for the glory of God? through the work of Jesus Christ. And if they don't, your life is going to be 
harder than it ever needed to be. I promise you, when you start looking for that person, if you will look for that first, all the other stuff will fall into place. I remember seeing Laura for the first time and thinking, wow, she's pretty. And we went on our first date, went to Frisco, Texas, to the Frisco Community Theater. And I had gone online, I had never been up there, but I had gone online and I found tickets to a play that they were doing, Romeo and Juliet. And the tickets were really expensive, and so I assumed it was kind of a fancy deal, right? It was not. It was in this little dilapidated park, and it had a little building, and half the actors were high school students, and Romeo at some point strips down to his boxer shorts, and he's about 87 pounds, and he's got a head like this, he looks like a lollipop, and he climbs up the trellis to Juliet, and uh, the, uh, you know, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? Well, Romeo's climbing up the trellis. He's coming right to you, right? Nobody knows exactly what's going on in the block in here. And uh, this is our first date. And it is bizarre and weird, and we had the best time. And I remember walking up the sidewalk to the thing before it's getting started. And she had dressed up kind of fancy, and I had dressed up kind of fancy. And I didn't realize that the entire audience was just moms and dads cheering on these kids. And her heel on her shoe got caught in the sidewalk, and she tripped, and she grabbed my arm, and she said, can I hold on to your arm? And I said, I hope you never let go. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> it was that spot I took her back a year later, and that's where I proposed to her, right? Uh, she had so many gifted qualities. She's smart, and she's funny. She's opinionated. I really like that. <laughs> But what I loved the most was she said, look, before this gets serious, I need you to know, I told our father that I would go wherever he called me to go and I would do whatever he called me to do. And I can't marry somebody who's not about that same business. This is what you need to say to the person that you are considering marrying. My first responsibility is not to you, it is to the Lord our God. I'm going to go wherever he tells me to go. I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do. If you can't say the same thing, then run from that relationship, right? Uh, head out the back, Jack, get on the bus, Gus, no need to discuss much, right? That's marriage gospel from Paul Simon. But that's the truth. Guard that relationship. Guard it with your life. Number four, keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, what can man do to me? Of course, we know from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that we're called to avoid the love of money, that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not evil to have money, but it's evil to love money. It's easy to do. I think Christians in the West have struggled mightily with the commendation of Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and also in Matthew's gospel that it is extraordinarily difficult for the wealthy to make their way into the kingdom of God, that it's harder than a camel moving through the eye of a needle. The issue is difficult, and we'll come back to dependence in a moment. But you'll see that there are people who have things, right? Verse 5, keep you free from the love of money and be content with what you have. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. What about the people in the first century who aren't suffering? What happens when I look down the street and I find my neighbor, and maybe he even professes to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and his life is just easy? He never has any problems. He never has any money problems, never has any relationship problems. It's just... What about the person over there who doesn't have to suffer, whose journey to Jesus appears to have fewer obstacles? And the call from the author here is, you focus on you. Whatever today brings you, just know that the Lord is with you. And that's the final relationship relating to the Lord. The Lord will be our provision here. And we find a citation from Deuteronomy chapter 31. And if you look at it here structurally, something's actually uh, interesting happening. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, in the English language, we use negatives all the time, right? I do not want the Three Musketeers bar, right? I've expressed that in a single negative. 
Uh, in English, though, we do something called canceling out the negative with a double negative. Um, if I say I do want the Three Musketeers bar, I can say I, I don't not want the candy bar. I've used a double negative, and I've made it a positive, right? I love that story about the English teacher who says, you know, you can express a negative with a negative and a positive with a double negative, but you can never express a negative with a double positive. And the kid in the back of the class goes, yeah, right. <laughs> in Greek, it works a little bit differently. Instead of having negatives that balance each other out, they just build. They're cumulative. There are five here in one sentence. Nothing, never, ever, ever, ever can separate you from this God who is willing to provide for you. The believer lives his most healthy life, spiritually speaking, when he is dependent on the Lord his God. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The citation there from Deuteronomy 31. You remember, here is the Lord. He is getting ready to lead the people into the land that he had promised to them. The land we'll find later is infested with giants. It's a terrifying land full of big cities with large walls. How are we ever going to make it? And into this terrifying new world, the Lord says, I'll lead you. Don't worry about it. I'll fight your battles. I'll win your victories. I'll lead your armies. I'll never forsake you. It's the same message that he's delivering here to the believers in Hebrews chapter 13. You're marching into this new and foreign and frightening world where you are a vast minority among those who profess faith. You're going to make it. Why? Because I'm never, ever going to leave you, never going to forsake you, never going to abandon you, never not going to meet your needs. It's hard for us to think about dependence because it's such a struggle in our current sociological climate, right? We want our kids to be independent. Now, I've got a seven-year-old who's at home feeling small this morning. And, and of the, the two kids we have now on the outside, she is the one who fiercely, fiercely does not want your help, right? Right? Hey, Grace, you're learning to tie your shoes. You're doing a good job. You want help? No, I can do it. Hey, uh, Grace, you want a smoothie. Can I get the, no, and she's climbing on the counter. She's pulling out. She does not want your help. Hey, get out your homework. Let's take a look. Annabelle would love for you to sit beside her and just moral support the entire time she's working on homework. Hey, Grace, you have to write an essay, as she had to do this week on Abraham Lincoln. You need help? I've got it. It's fine. 16th president. Shot. Good guy. Done. I got it, right? And we foster that independence, and we want them to be independent. Nobody wants to have the 30-year-old living in their basement who's got a part-time job slinging fries and spends all of his waking time on the Xbox. And You understand? But there is a kind of dependence on the Lord which is not only permissible, it's essential. It's essential. We're told not only to be dependent on each other here in the body of Christ, we're told that relying on the Lord and seeing Him as our chief source of all that we need is essential, it's vital, it's necessary to produce an enduring kind of faith. So instead of thinking about the child who just can't do things for themselves, who's, who's lazy, who's unmotivated, that's not what we're talking about here. Think instead maybe... There's a young child in another world who's been orphaned and abandoned out onto the streets. And they are struggling to survive. Every scrap of clothing that they wear comes as they reach a sneaky hand into a lost and found bin somewhere. Every morsel of food comes from a trash can outside of a restaurant. Every bit of warmth is them walking through a public place hoping they won't be noticed. And then, on one miraculous day, they're adopted. And they're brought into a home of love and provision that they've never known. And they're clothed in the best clothes and fed the best food. And they know the warmth not only 
of a fire in the hearth, but also in the compassion and love of a Father who will love them to the very end. Would we fault that child for dependence? That's what they've been called to. That's what we've been called to. We are miserable at eking out a living all by ourselves. We will not have life and life abundant until we yield to the invitation of the Father to be adopted through the miraculous bloody work of Jesus Christ. To say that he is my helper, I will not fear. And whatever maladies and calamities and hate the world throws at me, I am safe in the arms of God. God my Father. And I will fight for these relationships. Of course, this list isn't representative of every relationship in the believer's life. But it's safe to say that without pursuing these healthy relationships, we won't be ready for what comes next. Are you ready? The challenge is coming. In hospitality to strangers, in guarding our marriages, in embracing those in our own body who rejoice and weep, in resisting the temptation to be jealous of those who aren't, and in fleeing to the Lord our God, our source and our strength, our shield and our provider, our help in days of trouble, there is hope. There is hope for persevering, enduring faith. Father, give us what we need and help us to be content when we have it. We know from Psalm 73 that our greatest hope is you and we always have you. And there's no man or woman or law or scheme on the planet that can separate us from you and your love given to us by Jesus Christ who bled and died and rose again that we might endure and have our final home with you. In his name we pray, amen. To celebrate what God has done and is doing for us, I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing together in praise. Praise God from... can endure. Your faith will hold firm. He will carry you by his great mercy to the very end. Rely on him. Amen.